Well, good morning and welcome to Southland. My name is Lydia and this is Benji and our whole team. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. If you're new here, an extra special welcome to you. We started our services by singing together, aligning our hearts and declaring who God is. So would you guys go ahead and stand up and let's sing together. No more houses built on sand for me. No more idols will receive this offering. No more leaning only on our understanding. Jesus, we will trust in you. Jesus, we will trust in you. See that again. And no more houses built on sand for me. No more idols will receive us offering. No more leaning only on our understanding. Jesus, we will trust in you. Jesus, we will trust in you. We won't be ashamed of your name, Jesus. We will not hide.
Start the morning with you all. So glad you're here. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. South, and we spent the day here in Eastern Kentucky meeting with our ministry partners and church plants in the area, finding ways that we can help our neighbors in the east that are recovering from the devastating floods. Thank you in advance for the ways you've already responded. We're looking for ways and opportunities, and we're sharing those at our website, southland.church slash response. There are many options, ways that you and your family can step up and give and serve and share what you have with everyone here. Thank you in advance for stepping up to the challenges and meeting the opportunities ahead of us. We're committed to being involved in the days, weeks, and months to come. So again, go to southland.church slash response and thank you for serving and stepping up to help our neighbors recover from the devastating flood. Good morning, my name is Lydia and I am part of the team here at Southland. And I'd like to just start today by saying thank you for joining us in prayer for Eastern Kentucky and also for your patience as we've been evaluating how the best way to respond as a church is. So many of you have been willing and eager to help and I am happy to tell you that we now have some clear instructions on the best ways to help the most people. And you can find all of that by going to the response page that we've set up at southland.church slash response. There are a lot of opportunities for you to get to go serve in Eastern Kentucky, as well as ways that you can donate. Now, if you're able to donate some of the items from the list on that page, I wanna give you a couple heads up. 
One is that donations will be taken this week, Monday through Thursday. And two is that they won't actually be brought to this campus. We need those donations to go directly to our partner, which is the Christian Appalachian Project at 2528 Palumbo Drive in Lexington. That way those things can be loaded up straight onto a truck that'll go right to Eastern Kentucky. We're so grateful for the ways that you guys are partnering with us. And again, to find out all the information about how to get involved with the response, you can go to Southland church slash response. Well, it has been a hot summer in Kentucky as well. It would not surprise me to be standing in the line at Kroger and hear somebody say, it's hotter than a blister bug in a pepper patch. And then you have to respond with the classic, say it with me if you know it, it's not the heat, it's the Humidity, that's right, and everybody said amen. Well, some of you are really excited to hold on to summer for a few more weeks, and the rest of us are gonna be welcoming that cooler weather. But whichever kind of person you are, we can't deny that summer is coming to an end. Families are returning from vacation, kids are going back to school, students are coming back on campus. It's honestly one of my favorite times of the year because we return to some rhythms and routines after the season of summer. One routine that people often return to or start for the first time at the beginning of fall is the habit of going to church. And so to celebrate that, next week we are going to have a super fun fall kickoff. August 14th, we're going to start a new series. We're going to have games and food and fun. So be sure to plan to get here a little bit early and stay a little after to see everything that we've got planned. At last year's fall kickoff, I volunteered to help run the bounce houses, and I took it as my solemn duty to make sure that your kids had a darn tootin' good time and that they were worn out enough to take a good nap in the afternoon. It was a win-win. It's also a perfect time for you to invite a friend or a family member or a neighbor to come be a part. There is always room for us to pull in an extra chair and construction does not have to hinder invitation. So if you'd like to learn more about everything coming up there, you can head to our website at southland.church. One more thing that we're looking forward to is the launch of our care groups again this fall. Our care groups are specifically to help support some difficult life circumstances. We have groups for divorce care, for grief share, for young widows. We also have groups that support people with a variety of mental health issues and for people who work as caregivers or as first responders. My husband is currently an EMT, and he will soon be graduating from the Lexington Fire Academy as a firefighter. And I am grateful to know that there are groups that exist to help support some of the unique and specific challenges that come with certain professions, like first responders, or just other hard life circumstances that people from all walks of life can experience, like addiction or divorce or grief. So if you or somebody that you know would benefit from a loving and supportive community that's centered on Jesus but specific to a life circumstance, be sure to come talk to one of our care team members at the help desk today, or you can hop on our campus page at southland.church slash nicholasville. Well, today we're going to be finishing up our series called Road Warriors, and if you've missed any of the messages, they've been great, and you can always catch up on those online. But for now, go ahead, grab your Bible or your Bible app, and we will join in with the rest of our church. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we? Good, 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 good. Hey, uh, I have a great honor to introduce somebody to you today. A couple years ago, uh, we had a team of people as we were beginning our church planting initiatives go on a trip, and they came back uh, raving about this young man that they had run into. And as they're describing him to John and I, we're like, yeah, we know him. He grew up here at Southland, and his name is Connor Hall. And uh, Connor moved back up here to the Lexington area uh, to help serve on our team without pay and did that literally uh, night and day for a long time. And we started to realize that we think it was like illegal, so we got to start paying this guy. And so we brought, him, we brought him on our staff, and he has been helping with literally anything and everything that we throw his direction, including uh, young adults and church planting. And today, preaching. So if you would, just give him a warm Southland welcome. Thank you, guys. 
Uh, well, several years ago, uh, I got invited to an outdoor wedding. And it was good friends with several people in the wedding party, was good friends with the bride, and was also good friends with the best man. And what you should know about this particular best man is that he was dating one of the bridesmaids in the wedding party. And what you should also know about this particular best man is that he was planning on breaking up with this particular bridesmaid at this particular wedding. And I already know what you're thinking, like, brilliant idea, like, break up with a bridesmaid on the day of her best friend's wedding, like, what could possibly go wrong? And sure enough, me and some friends that afternoon are gathered around in this courtyard, beautiful landscape, fountains everywhere, just an absolutely pristine venue, when all of a sudden, coming from behind me, I hear the sound of a young woman shouting, wait, you're breaking up with me? Now, not only did my friend uh, make the mistake of assuming that this young woman wouldn't make a scene if he broke up with her in public, but he also made the mistake of breaking up with this young woman while standing directly in front of a koi pond. <laughs> Some of you are ahead of me, and in just an ultimate power move, all five foot two of her, she shoves him hard in the chest, he goes stumbling back into this pond full tuxedo in front of everyone. Everyone gasps. A few of the bridesmaids actually cheered. I kind of thought you deserved that. <laughs> and other than having to climb out of this pond covered in lily pads, I think the worst part for my friend was then he had to stand through the ceremony. Like it hadn't even started yet. And word of the wise, if you're ever planning on breaking things off with someone at a wedding, at least wait until after the reception, okay? It's my only advice. Hey, I don't know what your favorite memory of the water is, but you probably have one. Like, maybe you were out fishing with your buddies recently, and you were reeling in what you thought was going to be your best catch ever, only to discover it was a boot or a toilet seat or something like that. Or What I do know is that whatever it is, it probably doesn't compare to some of the stories a man named John the Baptist could tell us. This fiery wilderness preacher, unorthodox as they possibly come, he invites the Israelites into the waters of baptism, and he urges them, repent, meaning a turn away from the sins that have caused you to disobey God and turn back towards him. In other words, make a U-turn. And we're not told much about John's life outside of his ministry, but the first time we meet him in Scripture, he's inside his mother's belly, like Luke tells us in the first chapter of his gospel that John's mother Elizabeth was a family relative to Mary. And not long after Mary is told by an angel that she'll give birth to a son named Jesus, she visits Elizabeth. And when she does, the Bible tells us Elizabeth's child leaped within her. Once, one summer I worked in an office with a young woman who was pregnant with her first child. And no matter how serious of a meeting we were all in, she would always interrupt it right in the middle and say, guys, 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 the baby's kicking. Come feel it. And all the women would gather around her and squeal, and all the guys would make a beeline for the other side of the room. Like, one minute we're staring at a pie chart, next minute we got people feeling her belly. It was just weird, okay? But what Elizabeth feels in this moment, like, this is no ordinary kick, because this is no ordinary baby. Now, in fact, Elizabeth says to Mary, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Even inside the belly of Elizabeth, John the Baptist recognizes the presence of the Lord is near. And about 30 years later, John grows into adulthood and boldly preaches this same message to anyone who will listen. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 tells us this, in those days... John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah, who we talked about the first week of this series, was speaking about John when he said this, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locust and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all over Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. 
Like Scott said earlier, I grew up here at Southland, but before coming on staff, I was a student pastor at a church down in Nashville for seven years. And so last summer, as I was moving back to Nashville and getting settled, I was in the pharmacy one day, and I ran into an old family friend I hadn't seen in a long time, this elderly woman, sweet, super excited to see that I was back. And very encouraging, she put her arm around me and she said, now I want you to know that church you're at over there at Southland, you guys have the best preacher in Kentucky. And I didn't know if she was talking about John or Scott. Either way, I just agreed with her. I was like, yeah, they're, they're both awesome. But then she got this look of disappointment on her face, and she pulled me in close and just kind of whispered, I just wish he'd wear a nicer shirt. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how to help you with that, okay? I'll be sure to bring that up in our staff meeting. <laughs> Hey, we may not look like most preachers, okay? We, we get it. But this John the Baptist guy, this guy takes it to another level. Like, like, he doesn't fit the mold of most preachers of his day. For starters, he's wearing camel hair in the middle of the desert eating honey-roasted bugs. He stands out, okay? Not to mention, John doesn't even live where most people live, No, instead he makes the conscious decision to remove himself from society and live off the land in one of the most remote areas of the wilderness. John is like this weird combination between Bear Grylls, Man vs. Wild, and Billy Graham. Just eating bugs, giving hugs, preaching the word, okay? But what Matthew's description tells us is that John is a harsh dude from a harsh place. Like, he isn't some soft eloquent pastor. No, no, John is about as cuddly as a cactus that he probably sleeps under. John is a harsh dude, but this allows him to preach what many people today would consider to be a harsh message. Because it goes against the narrative that you and I, we we talked about at the beginning of this series that says you're perfect just the way you are. My girlfriend Hannah and I have been dating about a year now, and she is the absolute greatest thing in the world to me. Um, And I'm not saying that just because I'm in front of like a few thousand people right now. This isn't brownie points. I would tell you that if it was just me and you. But what she would tell you is that the last two or three months of our relationship have looked different than the previous eight or nine months that we've been together. And she is one of the kindest, warmest people I've ever met who would never want to hurt anyone's feelings, especially mine. And so the way that she described it to me was like this. Babe, babe, we are in the most beautiful stage of our relationship when we are finally beginning to notice each other's flaws. And I said, absolutely. What, what, are, what are we talking about exactly? Like, I, don't, I haven't noticed any in you. <laughs> and friends, even though you and I know that this message isn't true about ourselves, in our world today, the last thing that our society wants to hear that this message is true about ourselves. That's why it didn't surprise me that in an article I came across recently about the different religious views of some of the most famous people in our world today, one of the few interviewed that identified herself as Christian said this, I've been a Christian a while now. I don't talk about it too much. I want to, but it's gotten a bad rep. Now, I want you to hear me on something. The first part of that statement, I'm really grateful for Like, I'm grateful she has a relationship with Jesus. I hope she continues in that. But the second part is really dangerous. And unfortunately, it's what I begin to see more and more people adopt. Because what it says is, I'll share the message of Jesus, as long as it's a popular one. The minute it's not, I won't. And the reason I begin to see so many fall into this way of thinking is because the Bible In its entirety, it does not preach a message of tolerance and acceptance and even celebration of sin. No, it preaches for the desperate need for us to be redeemed from sin. And that goes against the grain of our culture. It does not land well with modern ears. And you see, if you're anything like me, you would probably look at our world today and describe it in at least one, if not two words, loud and lost. 
And the problem is that these two words work in tandem with one another. Because oftentimes the loudest voices in our culture, the ones that we give the most attention to, the ones that we give the biggest platform to, are often the voices of the most lost people, hurt people, angry people, confused people, broken people, and even dangerous people. And what our society has decided in its wisdom is that loving lost people actually means letting lost people lead us. It's a ridiculous sentence. Like you wouldn't use that strategy for anything else in the world. You'd never get into a car with someone you knew couldn't see well and say, hey, do me a favor, take off your glasses, floor it down the interstate 90 miles an hour. Wherever the rest of us in the car end up is fine with us. You wouldn't do that. But unfortunately, what we're lectured and told by society is that we need to adapt to the lifestyles of lost and broken people, adopt their ways of thinking so that we can become more tolerant, more understanding, and more culturally relevant. Friends, I can't think of anything else in the world that the devil would want more for you or for me to believe that sin makes us relevant. Because you see, when the idea of sin becomes relevant, the need for a savior from sin becomes irrelevant. And think about it. There's no need to be redeemed from something that isn't harmful. And so Satan's narrative becomes, let's erase the idea that any behavior is harmful or destructive behavior. Let's remove the idea of shame altogether in our culture instead of turning from the things that have caused us to feel the shame to begin with. Let's nurture, foster, and grow a culture of offensive people who are offended by the fact that anyone else would be offended. And if it sounds like a ridiculous way of thinking, it's because it is a ridiculous way of thinking. Unfortunately, it's a popular one. John the Baptist had the opportunity to preach a popular message. Instead, he preached an important one. You see, John didn't preach a sermon. He shouted a warning, a warning that just said, turn back. You're headed the wrong way. You think what you're doing is the right thing, but you're headed straight into enemy territory. See, unlike our culture, John isn't swayed whether or not his message goes the same direction as the crowd. He understands that the crowd isn't always headed in the right direction. John is a man who has nothing to lose, but he understands that his audience, the Israelites, have everything to lose. He isn't just some hellfire and brimstone preacher who's just eager to condemn lost and broken people. No, no, John's attitude points to someone who is desperate to save them. And this boldness, it not only allows him to preach a message like this to a normal Jewish audience, it allows him to be bold and stand up to a group of religious bullies who come to question him. Verse 7 says this, But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptized, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now, that's a rough thing to call somebody. So just to give you some context, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two separate groups of the religious elite, of polarizing political and religious leaders. Uh, Pharisees mainly focused on hall monitoring people on the local level of synagogues with religious law. Uh, Sadducees were a group of wealthy, corrupt religious priests who were known for their cooperation with the Roman government. And what you need to know is that these two groups hated one another. But when it comes to the Israelites... Like these two religious groups had become so big, so influential, so powerful that it forced common Jewish people to feel like they had to pick between the lesser of two evil and say, well, I hate what this party stands for, but I hate what this party stands for even more. And I know that none of us in this room have ever faced that tension before, especially around November. Some of you are mad. Some of you are like, amen, okay? But, But here's this wilderness preacher who he offers people a third option. And not only is he brutally honest with them, but he looks at this group of religious elite and says, no, 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 you're both wrong. Like, you're, not, you're not here to be baptized. This is just a ritual cleansing bath in front of everyone. You're not interested in actually changing anything about yourselves. This is just another ceremony for you. 
few months ago, I had the privilege of getting to do the ceremony for one of my good friend's weddings. And I'd met him in a Bible study years ago and uh, had seen him navigate years of being single and just trying to find the right one. And so it was a big honor for me to get to be with him on that day, celebrating the fact that he finally did. Uh, Now, uh, it's been a few months since he and his wife tied the knot. If I were to see him out today on a date with another female, not only would I want to kill him, his wife actually would kill him. Like he wouldn't be alive any longer. That conversation would go a lot better with me than it would with her. But as his friend, I would be forced to confront him and say, hey, like, what are you doing? Like you're, you're married now. You don't get to just do that anymore. Like right, we, were, we had a ceremony. Like were you there? Did, did any of that mean anything to you? But see, the word wedding and the word marriage have two different meanings. One word only celebrates the other. John the Baptist, his baptism only celebrated repentance. Our baptism today celebrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. John understands that religious rituals are only ceremonial if they are not accompanied by a change of heart. So he looks at these two groups of religious elite and he calls both of them out and says, no, 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 prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. And this verse is really important because it gives us the actual definition of the word repentance. You see, a lot of times, I think in our heads sometimes what we think repentance means is, God, I'm sorry. We feel guilty and hopeless for the things that we've done, and so we run to God and ask for forgiveness. And that's a really good thing to do. That's an important thing to do. That's a great place to start. But if you're anything like me, stopping here, it just means you're sorry a lot. You feel guilty a lot. You have to run to God and ask for forgiveness a lot, and you're constantly apologizing for the same things over and over again. And not only does repentance mean, God, I'm sorry, what it also means is, God, I'm tired. God, I'm, I'm tired of eating myself sick. I just, just can't fight this struggle that I have with food. I, I don't want it to be like this anymore. God, I'm tired of blacking out. Told myself I wasn't gonna drink, but I had one glass and I just don't know when to stop. God, I don't wanna live like this anymore. God, I'm tired of gossip, wanted to be a part of the group, wanted to fit in. I shouldn't have said that about another person, and I don't want my words to ever hurt somebody like that again. You see, repentance isn't just when we run to God and say, God, I'm sorry. It's when we lean into his power and say, God, I'm tired of this. But God, this is too heavy for me to lift, so I need you to help lift it from me. You see, John knew that someone was coming to carry what God knew that you and I could never carry on our own, and that's a weight of the word called sin. So he tells the Israelites this in verse 11, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and carry his sandals. And he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and with fire. You see, up to this point, some questions had began to surface if John himself was actually the Messiah, if he was the one who he'd been speaking about all along. And not only does John adamantly deny that he would ever be the Messiah, he humbles himself even more and says, not only am I unfit to carry all of your sins, I'm unfit to carry the actual Messiah's sandals, a pair of sandals that'll soon be standing on the edge of the Jordan River, and the Messiah with whom he'll soon be face to face. And in the ultimate God moment, I like to think in that moment that Jesus smiled on John in his humility, and he grants him with an opportunity that he could never deserve, but a memory of the water that he'll never forget. He says, John, I'm here. It's me. Baptize me. You can't blame John for arguing with him. 
I mean, he knows that Jesus has no reason to be baptized, let alone by somebody like him. He has nothing to repent of. He's lived a life without sin and is the one that John has been preaching about all along. And he probably wanted to pull Jesus aside, his cousin in that moment, and say, hey, look, man, the whole point of this was for me to point people to you, not the other way around. So we don't need to do this. Jesus tells him, no. No, we must carry out all that God requires. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. That moment in the water, on a far more important moment on the cross. You see, both John the Baptist and Jesus were two men who understood their mission. One turned people from sin, the other died for sin. One paved the way, the other was the way. And there's a reason that Jesus would go on to call John the greatest man ever born. You see, John was a man who wanted no praise, no following. He only wanted to praise. He only wanted to follow. And that's why he isn't the least bit upset or surprised by the fact that some of his own followers started to follow Jesus. No, instead he encouraged it. He said, no, no, no. This is what should happen. He must become greater. I must become less. John understood that he was the very last leg of a very important race of prophets, but that there would be no victory if that baton wasn't passed to the only one who is capable over sin and death. And if John were here today, he'd preach a far better sermon than I could ever even hope to preach to you, but I think his message would be the same one today as it was for the Israelites, and that message is in this world. There is one way, and one way only, and his name is Jesus. Rich Philotus puts it a lot better than I can. He writes this, John the Baptist is one of my favorite people in scripture. He knew who he wasn't. I am not the Messiah. And he knew who he was. I am a voice in the wilderness. Every day, I need to get clear in my soul who I am and who I am not. Otherwise, I find myself living a life God never called me to. And for those of us this morning who some days feel in the midst of our sin that we're not living a life that God called us to, it raises a really important question. Who are you? And who are you not? I guess a better way to ask it would be the question that we asked at the beginning of this series. And that question is, what road am I on? A couple of years ago, a friend of mine from Nashville that I worked with was visiting some friends down in Alabama one weekend, and he'd been down there several days, and on his drive back one evening, about four hours into his trip, he noticed, man, I really should be getting home by now. So thinking that he'd missed his exit, he pulled over into a gas station, and as he did, he noticed a, a palm tree at the front yard of it. I don't know if you know anything about Tennessee. We're not exactly known for our palm trees, okay? And so frantically, he pulled up his phone, and he realized that he'd driven four hours in the wrong direction. He made it to Florida. And as he's rehashing this story for me and some of my coworkers, an older gentleman that we worked with asked a really important question. He said, son, didn't you notice the signs? My friend candidly responded by telling him, no, I never pay attention to those. And a young woman that we worked with, she asked another great question. Hey, what about your GPS? And very sheepishly, he admitted there was a podcast he really wanted to listen to. So he silenced the voice feature on his GPS. And so not only did my friend uh, have to drive uh, four hours back to Alabama where he was, he then had to drive an additional four hours back to Nashville by himself in the middle of the night. And I know what you're thinking, Like, man, like, how can somebody ever mess up that big? Like, how could somebody ever be that lost? How could somebody ever travel that far down the wrong road? What kind of idiot would ever do something like that? And the answer's simple. This kind of idiot. This kind of far. This kind of lost. If I had to guess... Same kind of loss that you've been before. 
You see, I don't know about you, but I've spent years of my life traveling down roads I had no business being on. Ignored every wrong way and dead end sign you can possibly imagine. Silenced the voices in my life that have desperately tried to steer me back in the right direction. And then suddenly I look up and I ask myself the same question I always do. Where am I? How did I get here? How am I ever going to make it back? I can make fun of my friend all I want to, but to his credit, you know what he didn't do? Stay there. You're probably thinking, well, yeah, of course not. That would be ridiculous. I mean, just because you travel down a wrong road doesn't mean you have to stay wherever it ends up, and you're absolutely right. You don't. Which can only mean, for us, you don't have to stay in the worry. You don't have to stay in the doubt. You don't have to stay in the gossip. You don't have to stay in the lies. You don't have to stay in the addiction. You don't have to stay in the abuse. You don't have to stay in the pornography. You don't have to stay in the affair. And how do I know? Because a prophet named Isaiah puts it this way, because by his wounds, we are healed. Friends, I don't know where this world has led you. But you don't have to stay on the road to lost and broken any longer. But you know what you do have to do? Turn around. So considering the fact that you are only one turn away from home, my advice, make a U-turn. And I don't mean just to turn back in the right direction, but a literal turn away from you. And to turn towards him so that he can become greater, so that he can become the greatest thing in your life. Friends, I don't know what it is today that you need to turn away from. But if I encourage you at all, as a guy who's driven down a lot of roads that he shouldn't be on, Jesus is the only thing in this world worth turning to. Make the decision to turn to him today. And I promise it will be the best turn your life ever takes. Let me pray for us. Father God, God, we're so grateful God, that you are a father that we can not only run to and, and say I'm sorry, but that we can collapse in your arms and Say, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of feeling lost and broken. God, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for your love and that you sent your son Jesus to pay the wages of sin and death that we could never pay on our own and bring us back to you. God, just pray for any person in this room this morning who might feel lost, might feel broken might feel like they're never going to make it back. Just pray that they would just feel the courage just to process that with somebody on our team. Make a turn back towards you today. Turn away from themselves so that you can become greater, that we can become less. God, I'm grateful for your love. Grateful for this church who understands that your son Jesus is the only way. He always will be. Most of all, I'm grateful for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Every week we take a few moments to stop and remember. But what is it that we're remembering? Part of what we remember is the ways that we've fallen short in our own sin. Our sin is the reason why we need a Savior. But communion, this time here and now, is about more than just remembering us and our sin. It's about remembering Jesus and his grace. This isn't something that we do once we've gotten everything right on our end. Jesus said, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. It's not about how worthy we are, but about how worthy he is and about how by grace he is the one who makes it possible for us to sit at a table with God. It's his body and his blood that makes that possible. That's what the blood, that's what the juice and the bread represent. 
Now, you're not obligated to participate if you're not familiar with communion, but right up here on the screens, we're going to have some scripture, and I just encourage you to read and reflect on that. We'll also have a number that you can text if you need prayer about anything, and our prayer team will be right up here at the front by the stage today after the service, and they would love to pray with you and pray for you. But as you eat and you drink today, do so with an awareness that Jesus is still today, in this moment right now, a sufficient Savior for all of our sin, and he offers us grace in any situation that we're up against. We don't fix our eyes on ourselves. We turn the focus off of us and fix our eyes on Jesus, the one Savior that we need and the Savior that we have. Let's take a few moments to do that right now. One 
Continue to worship. There is no shadow. There is no shadow that could ever overcome your light. There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. We've already won. There is no weapon. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already Come on, sing it. Show me one thing. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the break. Anything is possible. Come on, show me. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what else he can't part. He's the God of it's possible. Come on, let's sing of his kingdom. And there is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, 
have a baptism we'd like to celebrate so you can just take one moment and direct your attention to the baptistry well hey this is miss zoe today is her 10th birthday so can we show her some love absolutely she decided this summer that uh, it was time to be baptized and no better day uh, to become a new creation than on your birthday so zoe repeat after me i believe i believe with all my heart with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Hey, based on that confession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Death, burial, resurrection. Let's give it up for Zoe one more time. Hey, how about her? Yeah. Well, hey, just a reminder, our prayer team is, is gonna be right here up front and uh, they're ready to pray with you, receive you. And hey, I wanna remind you next weekend, you don't wanna miss it. It's gonna be our fall kickoff weekend. We'll obviously come together to worship. We're gonna have a lot of fun things in the lobby and the parking lot that you wanna be a part of. So bring your friends, bring your family. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Have a great week.